We welcome you all to our Sunday morning roundtable discussion. Today is Sunday, January 28, 2018, and we are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. And Lawrence will lead us in our morning prayer. Oh my God, I offer as a consecrated gift upon thine altar a heart dedicated to thy service, lips speaking only words of charity, love, and truth, thoughts striving to be only the true thoughts of the mind of God. Help me to endure unto the end, strong in the faith, powerful in the truth, all the influence that I can bring to bear, all the force of tongue or pen that is mine, I offer in thy service. May heaven help, consecrate, and accept. Thank you. And then Mary Baker Eddy, Miscellaneous Writings. We today in this classroom are enough to convert the world if we are of one mind, for then the whole world will feel the influence of this mind as when the earth was without form and mind spake and form appeared. Our subject this morning is truth. The golden text is Psalm 86, verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Now, I'd like to say that this morning, um, Elizabeth wrote this lesson, and it's a, a wonderful one. I don't, we've never had one about the remnant before. We had had a Bible or a round table about the remnant several weeks ago, and then she got the idea to do a Wednesday service on the remnant, and then from there, there she crafted it into a weekly lesson, and it goes so well with the lesson truth. So I am so grateful to all of you who are writing lessons, proofing lessons, and all the things that you all are doing, working on the forum, the many ways you contribute with such originality and, uh, and demonstration. It's a demonstration to do this. And in order to demonstrate, you have to be hearing God's voice. So I think we'll start with the watching point, another short one, and it's number 151. Watch, lest as you taxi around in your mental airplane, trying to get up enough speed to rise above mortal mind or material evidence, you forget that no matter how much speed an airplane attains on the field, it does not rise until its elevators are pointed upward. Man can never rise any higher than his ideals or aspirations. If all he aspires to is material harmony, prosperity, and human good, nothing he does in Christian science can carry him higher than this limited human ideal. His elevators are still parallel with the level of materiality. End quote. Thank you. And that is now Ray in Florida who finds these, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so many of you are contributing in so many different ways, and I, even if I haven't mentioned you all, I'm so very grateful. We all are grateful. So comments on that watching point. I love Gilbert Carpenter's analogies. He always, he always comes up with the right way to get you to understand. So very much appreciate that. He does. This is uh, Michael. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, I remember somebody saying that uh, if you're all you're looking for is uh, comfort and matter, then that's all you're going to get, and and even that might turn on you at some point. So. Um, it reminds me of this, of this, uh, this watching point. Thank you. Yes, it will turn on you. That's all you're seeking. And it really ties in with the the idea of a remnant too, because the remnant is only a saving remnant, 
if you're looking for others too, you know, I, I if I be lifted up, will lift all my, unto me. So, it, you know, it's very pertinent, I think. Very, yes. I was looking for that. Thank you, Florence. And it also it, uh, reminds me of the uh, transitional qualities in science and health. Um, the, uh, the qualities that show, like, goodness, kindness, these are one level, and then the higher levels are uh, spiritual understanding. And um, it, it seems that most of Christianity is kind of happy with the just be a good person and be nice to people, and that's kind of as far as it gets you. And, you know, Christian science kind of pushes you to go further and, and demonstrate at a higher level. And so you, your aspirations affect that. Absolutely. It it's makes a reminder. Go ahead. It's a reminder to have my expectation be what God is expecting for me, where he wants me to be in my understanding and demonstration. This is why the world needs Christian science, so they can go higher. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, but it really ma it really makes all the difference what you aspire to, doesn't it? Because if your aspiration is not for Christian science, then Christian science is not going to do anything for you because you don't really care about it. All you care about is yourself and what it's going to give you. And that's why in our golden text, teach me thy way, O Lord. If you want to know the truth, you have to aspire to it. I mean, you have to have a desire to learn it. And if you don't have a desire to learn the truth, if you're just sort of happy, content, moping along with mediocrity and false beliefs, then you're, you know, all the Christian science in the world isn't going to isn't going to do you any good because you're not going to care about it. And, and remind, know, sorry. When um, Florence was reading the prayer, that's what that prayer is, and that's why we started our roundtable with it every week. Powerful in the truth, strong in the faith, all the influence that I can bring to bear, all the force of tongue or pen that is mine, I offer in thy service, you're offering it in God's service, not to make yourself happy and healthy, wealthy, and wise. In his service. Mrs. Evans used to tell us the healing was the bait. You know, people all want to be healed, and they come for that. But soon after, your aspirations must grow to something much higher than just making your own life comfortable. Go ahead, Michael. I was just going to say, somebody once mentioned to me that it's interesting that the word uh, casual and casualty, you know, are, are linked, so you can't be too casual about your sure. approach to trying to learn Christian science. <laughs> That's very yeah. good. That's true. You get sloppy, casual. Mm -hmm. And I think our own fervent desire for this truth is what allows us to want to share. I read an article um, in 1921, and it's talking about impotent remnant. <laughs> and it asks the question, can a man be said really to love wisdom or to love righteousness who is not consumed with desire to communicate his truth to others and to make others good? So it's like... You know, if, our, if our own desire is to know this truth, we see the worst of it, then it makes us want to share, not keep the books away that could help others and so on. That's right. Thank you. That's a beautiful. Yeah, because oh. the flip side, if, if you are afraid to stand up for what you know to be true, if you are afraid to live it, to share it, it shows that you don't really love it. And it's that desire to know the truth, to work for it, to 
share it that distinguishes the remnant. I know, um, and, and we'll be answering this question continually. I think it was Mike's question, how do you know if you're part of the remnant, right, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we, we will be addressing that in many ways. I'd like uh, someone to read Citation 1 from the Bible. I can read it. <clears throat> okay, thank you. The re Zephaniah, the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Okay, there's some big hints in there about the remnant. And what are those? No, no lies, no deceitful tongue. <laughs> Yeah. Right. No gonna, fear. You're not no going to cheat anybody out of anything. Right. And, and no fear. It's emphasized a lot in not being afraid. Yes. Right. And they shall feed. They will give of what they have. And that love, that unselfish love, enables them to not be afraid. John. You think of Gideon's band. You know we've we've talked about that in former Bible classes. And w what were the characteristics <coughs> as they were whittling down the band? Alertness. Thank you. Alertness. Desire to do it. Yes. Do the work. And no fear. And no fear. And the alertness, the test was, um, you know, they, they drank with their heads up, not down. And they had kept a tool in their hand, as well as a weapon. I'd like um, Elizabeth now to read what she placed on the forum. Do you want me to read the whole thing, or...? I do. Anything? Okay. Uh, remnant, that which remains of an original body or substance. In reference to God's people, it means those who are faithful to his original truth despite apostasy and opposition. That's from BibleInfo.com. The idea of a remnant is found for 540 times in the Bible. Most of the time, the remnant concept is disguised by the way the words are translated into English. In the Old Testament, remnant is translated by six Hebrew root words, each of which has the underlying meaning of what is left, what remains, survivors, escapees, or the rest. That's from BibleStudyTools.com. The remnant, those who are faithful and obedient to God, has always been a minority, but despite this, has all the power on its side. <clears throat> I love what Mrs. Eddy writes in Pulpit and Press, quote, is not, man, is not a man metaphysically and mathematically number one, a unit, and therefore whole number, governed and protected by his divine principle, God? You have simply to preserve a scientific, positive sense of unity with your divine source and daily demonstrate this. Then you will find that one is as important a factor as duodecillions in being and doing right, and thus demonstrating deific principle. A dewdrop reflects the sun. Each of Christ's little ones reflects the infinite one, and therefore is the seer's declaration true that one on God's side is a majority. End quote. Thank you. That was beautiful and true, and you, you should all be feeling that wherever you go, in your home, in your business, if 
you have to enter a hospital, you go in with that authority of Christ. One with God is the majority. Your knowing this truth is what rules the day. That uh, she also, I love a, a group of wise thinkers more powerful than a room full of dullards or, or the might of empires. That's why what we read, um, also what we pray, we today in this classroom are enough to convert the world. That is the power of the remnant when they have aligned themselves with God Almighty. Now, in the past, how do you recognize the remnant? Do you, Mike? What or who was the remnant? Oh, well, that was uh, what I was kind of wondering about because when I went to class, my teacher said that the class and the association was a remnant. But then, uh, you know, so I thought, well, that's wonderful. And then uh, realizing that I uh, was having a tough time uh, demonstrating and such and the simple things and even the uh, clueless on the watches if we did have a watch uh, committee now in retrospect I look back and it's like well really didn't do anything that was useful and probably was doing more malpractice than the proper Christian science but then uh, seeing Elizabeth uh, writing and then I had the uh, idea to look at uh, the different usages of uh, of the remnant in uh, Strong's Concordance that really put it more powerfully that it is a very special elect group and uh, not uh, it, it's like Elijah's ability to uh, really make a change and uh, overcome the obstacles. Yeah. That's what it, well, that's what I derived from that. Thank you. And anyone else? I've, uh, I've also heard uh, it worded instead of uh, one with God is a majority. Uh, somebody said uh, one with God is a monopoly, like there's nothing left. So there is no opposition. This is another interesting way to look at it. Well, that's the ultimate truth. One with God is... God is all, so there is nothing else, yes. I think it's a different way of saying the same thing. That one with God has all the power that God is. To do right. You know, there's a couple other ways to recognize the remnant, and one of them that comes to mind is they're not comfortable with those that are, what shall I say, impure. They are comfortable with themselves as God's idea. And they are also comfortable being different from other people when they, as a matter of a clear conscience, are walking with God. Thank you. That's very, very true. You, you, you're probably not comfortable with the masses, the general people are thinking and doing. And, and in fact, you might even at times wonder about yourself why you aren't, why you don't feel comfortable with what the masses are doing. But I see it, if you look back through history, and certainly Bible history, I call it the golden chain. They're just people who rose up, whether they were elected, I mean, we go back and forth, or whether they elected themselves because they were hearing God's voice, so they rose up to do this work, and they carried it through. We have Abraham, I mean, Joseph, all, all of them. You know who they are. Mrs. Eddy. And, it, and so it continues. And whether we know we are the remnant or not, I don't know whether it's important. No, it doesn't really matter. No. As but, long as God knows. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, no. I, I would argue that point, and I think it is important because... I thought I was of the remnant, and I took that as a gospel. I think that's why I brought it up, and you know, now I so starkly realize, you know, how I wasn't, you know, doing anything really constructive, and uh, I wasn't 
majority were dead. I wasn't even a minority. I was doing nothing. I was, you know, I mean, I was trying, but that's that's uh, what I'm seeing is that's not good enough. So it's by the fruits you know them. So if you're just trying and not being successful, and you switch places and you look for the better, and that's to me the important thing. And then you can become a useful member of the remnant, which is my goal. Well, you're very hard on yourself, Mike. Yeah. Mrs. Eddie said, because trying is doing it. Mm-hmm. I don't like the word trying. But when you're working at it, you are doing it. And I look think... where it led you. The point is that the, that the remnant exists. Yes, and God knows it. Yeah, and the desire, continued desire. Right, you know. which you have had, Mike. He was actually the remnant and without knowing it because he was probably the only one questioning all this in his group. He was. And that yeah. made him the remnant because he thought he knew there was something more. Yes, good point. Sometimes with the, the remnant, you learn what it isn't. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> in other words, you turn <laughs> off the draw. Now, and this isn't something, okay, I'm the remnant. Oh, boy. I'm yes, really exactly. <laughs> that, that, we, uh uh-uh. That is not to be <laughs> tolerated. That's that's not what the remnant would do anyway, because they have the humility to know it's God working. So it's not that we're the remnant and we're better than the masses. No. But, no, but no personal <clears throat> sense to the remnant. Thank you. Exactly. And and Mike, right. what what you described is correct. In that it's important to recognize a good example. And to follow that good example insofar as that good example follows the Christ. Which is what Mrs. Eddy instructed all of us. You saw something good in someone and you wanted to emulate that. And if that leads you closer to God, then that's a good thing. To oh, me. thank you. That all makes sense. That all makes a lot of sense. Yep. And that's how I know this is a, a representation of the remnant, because every question I have, I get a sensible answer. <laughs> well, and that, that's, that could be a good sign of it. All of these are signs of it. To me, now, the remnant would be those that are carrying, carrying Mrs. Eddy's pure science continually. So, are we? Are you? And if you feel at peace with whatever answer you give yourself, then good. Faithfully doing watches, faithfully working at your science, reading your science and health, wanting to know more, keeping it pure and unadulterated, keeping it according to as Mrs. Eddy would have it. And if you don't feel at peace with the answer that you've given yourself, then ask God to teach you. As the golden text says. And aspire to walk in his truth. And if that is really your strong desire, he's not going to leave you hanging. (laughs) He's going to answer your prayer. I knew very little about football, but there was one play that I knew, <laughs> and that is that they that the quarterback sometimes would secretly be given the ball, so no one knew he had the ball, and and so the opposing team would be knocking over everybody else. In the meantime, the quarterback was running to make a touchdown. And he had the ball sort of hidden. And I always, that was the one thing I understood, and I always looked for that. And sometimes I think of it in, to some degree like that, because the remnant is quietly doing this, and, and nobody really knows it, right? <laughs> nobody, nobody knows it. They are unassuming. They are saying, I'm the remnant, and I'm saving the world. <laughs> <laughs> it, they're just quietly working at this. Like that quarterback with the ball, but no one knew it. No one knew he had the ball. It's like it would be a bad idea to draw attention to it. That way. <laughs> well, that's exactly, that's exactly right. 
That's right. Everybody points to the quarterback. It's right there. <laughs> Get him. That's right. But thank God for the website because that's how some of us came there. Right. It also is the wisdom that keeps the pure idea pure instead of focusing on personality and who's doing it. It's a divine activity, and let's keep it there. Well, and as Florence said earlier, you, you, you can't help but want to give what you know of the truth. You can't help it. It, 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 if you don't, you have no purpose to live. It, is, it becomes your purpose for living. But it's hard to share it with some people. You don't feel you can. Well, that's, that's the point. We have a website. We put it out there. Anybody who is serious in need will find it. Yeah, and it's... Who doesn't care, you know, they don't have to. Yeah, um, sorry. And Jesus said, you don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't waste your time. Isn't it it interesting that in in all of this, how many billions of people, only a certain amount find it. The Internet is there. I mean, people are searching, but some find it. Isn't it interesting? Yep. Yeah. Isn't it interesting? And the other big thing in the lesson, you know, the, the, you may know when first truth leads by what? The fewness of its followers. The fewness and faithfulness of its followers. So you can ask yourself, we are few and we are faithful. That's one good thing we've got <laughs> going. <laughs> so... Well, one thing that uh, what Gary said about if you're not getting the answer, then ask. And in the past, I really didn't uh, understand that. But lately, I mean, this is an example. I uh, texted the message to Mrs. Roberts and Mrs. Singletary about the remnant. And then uh, the next morning, I started to find answers about it. (laughs) So if you sincerely ask the question, I'm finding out that God truly does give you the answer. Well, and, and that, that is what's so great about Mike, and it also leads to very interesting discussions. He's not afraid to ask the questions. He puts himself out there, and that's great. It's a very good and legitimate question. I think everyone um, is searching. Like I, <clears throat> inside, you have that uh, want to know God and want to know more of uh, reasons why are you here and all that. And people go about it in different ways. Uh, I myself went through all sorts of, (laughs) trying all sorts of Buddhism, Taoism, Judaism, all kinds of um, uh, forms of of religion. And, And it's funny that when I found Christian Science, it was because I was taking care of this lady that was a Christian scientist, this unbeknownst to me. I only knew that she didn't take any medications, there was no doctor visiting, but she had nurses going in there and, and to help her out. And I remember one night that I was on duty, I pick up, I was, you know, awake, and I decided, well, let me, I look around, and I went into her library, and I found science and health. And I pick it up and I started reading it and I thought, oh my God, this is, this is great. What is this? And she couldn't talk, so I couldn't ask her. And, and by the way, she wasn't really that friendly anyways. So I look it up. I look up in the, uh, the time they have the yellow pages still. So I look it up, a Christian, scientist, uh, a Christian science room, which was in the next town where I lived at the time. And... And then from then on, I started because I thought it was, you know, I, that's how I found it. And, and ever since then, you just know that this is the truth and this is really the pearl of great price. So um, I think everybody is in that kind of journey. And like somebody said, you find it sometimes or you're led to the, uh, to the uh, web and, and, and to the web page and and you go on from there. Thank you. I, I know one of our newer persons 
said, you know, she found it on on the website, but she was looking at, for Christian Science, and this sort of perplexed me a little bit. She she couldn't find us, and then she did find us, and then later when she tried to find us again, she couldn't until she got our, the name of our website. But she felt like the whole thing had to have been God because suddenly we appeared, and um, and I know I never sought any of this. I, I don't think. Gary did either. I mean, our journey or how we got here and all of this and how our independence and even leading up to sitting here today, I never sought it out. I never said, I want to do this. I'm going to do this, boy. That's my plan. Never. All of these things just happened. And so, so it is. I just started by the fact that my son was in an Episcopal Sunday school where they weren't doing anything, and so I just passed by this church, the Christian Science Church, and just went in there, but then I was led to read Science and Health, and that was it. That's it. And we all, we all have these stories of how we found it, how we came. Yeah, and every story is different. It's, uh, you know, I think in some ways, and I don't remember who it was that said it this way, is that, you know, uh, the, the truth finds you when you seek it, when you're ready yes. and serious about it. The truth will find you when you open your heart to it. Thank you. That's exactly right. That's why the prayer, teach me, and your teacher will appear. So the stories are different, but the desire is the common thread. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, just to give you the other side of the coin, I had someone call for help this week. No one's been able to heal her. She's, of course, been in the organization, and um, and she seemed interested. So until I told her to, to come to church on Wednesday night, you know, to call in. <laughs> and, then, and then the next day I got this long message from her, oh, she could not possibly leave the mother church, could not possibly, and she viewed us as renegades, as illegitimate, an illegitimate son who rose up against their mother, it was a whole big thing, <laughs> so I, I'm just saying this because uh, there is this other side of the coin, and a lot of people think that this is what we are, and so we continue on with great humility, <laughs> and it wasn't even worth answering, so... Go ahead. I think that was... Oh, sorry, go ahead. You go ahead, Mike. Okay. What I was going to say is that I think that was... I'm glad you said that because it reminded me that was part of that question also because one of the things we were told in class, even though I thought it was a little silly, was to remain a member of the Mother Church. I only retired from there about two years ago. I'm telling you that was the most enslaving one dollar I spent a year <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, I never, for years I hadn't paid attention to anything, but there was just something about finally making that break that was totally freeing. Thank you. And it comes when you're ready for it, and it's nothing forced. We don't force anybody. That person, I'm not even getting into it with her, if that's how she feels. I mean, she hasn't had any healing, but she still wants to stay there. Um, well, whatever, till she learns. But it's it's so important that we understand this and and see it. It's a growing process. You grow into it, and it's you can't. Well, I I remember when when I first um, found the uh, Plainfield uh, uh, Christian Science website, and I remember at the time I I was a member or I was attending ten church here in New York. And I went, <clears throat> and I mentioned it to somebody, and they put this horror face, and they said, oh, no, no, you don't want to be involved with them. And so, you know, it might have happened to her the same way. Maybe she I'm mentioned sure it, it to somebody, I'm and sure they it totally put her off it. Yeah. Yes, yes. And that's why I'm bringing it up, because it is out there. And, um, and that's we have saw it on our YouTube, too, some of the comments. Oh, a rene renegade church, how... You have no legitimacy, and um, okay, 
But it, it also goes along with... Um, and how dare you have a Christmas Eve service because it's not in the manual. Right. <laughs> with candlelight at that. <laughs> and the rest of this statement, you may know when first truth leads by the fewness and faithfulness of its followers. Thus it is that the march of time bears onward freedom's banner. The powers of this world will fight and will command their sentinels not to let truth pass the guard until it subscribes to their systems. But science, heeding not the pointed bayonet, marches on. There is always some tumult, but there is a rallying to truth standard. And then later, spiritual, spiritual rationality, which is the power of reasoning, and free thought accompany approaching science and cannot be put down they will emancipate humanity and supplant unscientific means with so-called laws and so-called called laws. Thank you. God will overturn until he who comes, he comes whose right it is. So this idea of freedom of thought, your own reasoning, you figure it out, it's so important. And I, I have learned, and this is why I do it, I do not call it the Mother Church. It is not the Mother Church to me. It is not. I will not give it that, that to them. It is the Church of the BOD. And the center is the concrete center. The Mother Church, Mrs. Eddy's church, the extension, and the original church stand untouched in its purity. It absolutely is. Gary and I have to get up there because I want to see now what else they're doing. They're building a huge hotel and condominium, okay? <laughs> I mean, how dumb can people be? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, so that stands, and we keep it separate and apart. It is not the Mother Church. Do not call it the Mother Church. It's the Church of the BOD. They took it over as soon as she passed on and made it their conglomeration, their cement center. Which they people have been, Go ahead. I was just going to say, people have been brainwashed to follow the board of directors and can't imagine leaving. I mean, if they listen to Plainfield and, you know, listen to the roundtables or looked on the website, how could they argue <laughs> with the truth that's on there? And if they knew the history, then they would know it's the truth. That's exactly true. That's right. Oh, that's true. And someone once said, I don't remember who, that said that there are actually more practicing Christian scientists who are not part of they or that organization than there are within that organization. And, and I would never have thought that until I heard it, but it makes all the sense in the world. Yes, because I truly believe, believe that. it. <laughs> yeah. And many people don't want to he hear this discussion at all. It's upsetting. It's political to them or whatever. But it, I, and I understand what they're saying. They just want healing. They just want to spend the, the day talking about how God heals you and forget all this. But this is important. It's line upon line, precept upon precept. And the history is important. Now, yesterday I mentioned this fellow that... Um, Gary knew many years ago from the Cambridge Church in, Mass in Boston, Massachusetts, Cambridge. Cambridge, Mass. Yes, Cambridge, Cambridge, Mass. Yes. So, and anyway, he was very much a part of the organization, and um, he had an interview with Adelaide Still, which I mentioned to you. Um, well, anyway, he now—I didn't say this, but he now is not associated with them. He has, again, no animosity toward them, and we do not either. I, I speak like this, but with no animosity. I, I can't have animosity toward anyone or anything. We don't, but we have to let you know what's going on. Well, anyway, so he has no nothing to do with them. But he sent us, and I read from it several weeks ago when we talked about the remnant, and I'm going to have Gary read from it again. It is a very important article. So just listen carefully to what this man is saying. Okay, this, this friend of ours from Cambridge Mass sent us this article. It is written by, and I'm sure you can Google it and find it, by an Albert J. Nock, N-O-C-K. He lived from 1870 to 1945, and he was an in, 
influential American libertarian author, educationalist, theorist, and social critic of the early of the early and and historian. Well, whatever that means. Okay. Now he wrote this article. It's called it was called Isaiah's Job. Now it is interesting because how our lessons have developed. A few weeks ago we had the story of Azekiah, Azekiah dying and Isaiah having to take over. Uzziah. Uzziah, thank yeah. you. Uzziah. Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, thank you. And, and Isaiah saying, here I am, Lord. He got kind of beaten up a little bit to get, make sure there was no personal sense in him and all of that. And then he, here I am, Lord. And then he was given a job. Now the name of this article is Isaiah's Job. And it deals with a remnant. And Gary is going to read selections from it. So it's a bit long, but it's important. So go ahead. Just what I've marked. In the year of Uzziah's death, the Lord commissioned the prophet to go out and warn the people of the wrath to come. Tell them what a worthless lot they are, he said. Tell them what is wrong and why and what is going to happen unless they have a change of heart and straighten up. Don't mince matters. Make it clear that they are positively down to their last chance. Give it to them good and strong, and keep on giving it to them. I suppose perhaps I ought to tell you, he added, that it won't do any good. <laughs> the official class and their intelligentsia will turn up their noses at you, and the masses will not even listen. They will all keep on in their own ways until they carry everything down to destruction. And you will probably be lucky if you get out with your life. <laughs> Isaiah had been very willing to take on the job. In fact, he had asked for it. But the prospect put a new face on the situation. It raised the obvious question, why, if all that were so, if the enterprise were to be a failure from the start, was there any sense in starting it? Ah, the Lord said, you do not get the point. There is a remnant there that you know nothing about. They are obscure, unorganized, inarticulate, each one rubbing along as best he can. See, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> they need to be encouraged and braced up. Because when everything has gone completely to the dogs, they are the ones who will come back and build up a new society. And meanwhile, your preaching will reassure them and keep them hanging on. Your job is to take care of the remnant. So be off now and set about it. The mass man is one who has neither the force of intellect to apprehend the principles issuing in what we know as the human life, nor the force of character to adhere to those principles steadily and strictly as laws of conduct. And because such people make up the great, the overwhelming majority of mankind, they are col called collectively the masses. The line of differentiation between the masses and the remnant is set invariably by quality, not by circumstance. The remnant are those who, by force of intellect, are able to apprehend these principles, and by force of character, are able, at least measurably, to cleave to them. The masses are those who are unable to do either. Everyone with a message nowadays is eager to take, to take it to the masses. His first, last, and only thought is of mass acceptance and mass approval. His great care is to put his doctrine in such shape as will capture the masses' attention and interest. The main trouble with this mass man approach is its reaction upon the mission itself. It necessitates an opportunistic sophistication of one's doctrine, which profoundly alters its character and reduces it to a mere placebo. 
New Age. <clears throat> if a writer you aim at getting, if if a writer you aim at getting many, many readers, if a publisher many pub purchasers, if a philosopher many disciples, if a reformer many converts, if a musician many auditors, and so on. But as we see on all sides, in the realization of these several desires, the prophetic message is so heavily adulterated with trivialities in every instance that its effect on the masses is merely to harden them in their sins. Meanwhile, the remnant, aware of this adulteration, and of the desires that prompt it, turn their backs on the prophet and will have nothing to do with him or his message. Isaiah, on the other hand, worked under no such disabilities. He preached to the masses only in the sense that he preached publicly. Anyone who liked might listen. Anyone who liked might pass by. He knew that the remnant would listen. The remnant was only the best you have, whatever you may be. Give them that and they are satisfied. You have nothing more to worry about. The only attempt of the record, the only attempt of the kind on record, I believe, to count up the remnant, Elijah had fled from persecution into the desert, where the Lord presently overhauled him and asked what he was doing so far away from his job. He said that he was running away, not because he was a coward, but because all the remnant had been killed off except himself. He had got away only by the skin of his teeth, and and he being now all the remnant there was, if he were killed, the true faith would go flat. The Lord replied that he need not worry about that, for even without him, the true faith could probably manage to squeeze along somehow if it had to. And as for your figures on the remnant, he said, I don't mind telling you that there are 7,000 of them back there in Israel whom it seems you have not heard of, but you may take my word for it, that they are. There they are. The other certainty which the prophet of the remnant may always have is that the remnant will find him. There we go. He may rely on that with absolute assurance. He may be quite sure that the remnant will make their own way to him without any ad ventitious aids. And not only so, but if they find him employing such aids, as I said, it is ten to one they will smell a rat in them and will shear off. Such instances as these are probably not infrequent, for without presuming to enroll ourselves among the remnant, we can all no doubt remember having found ourselves suddenly under the influence of an idea, the source of which we cannot possibly identify. It came to us afterward, as we say, that is, we are aware of it only after it has shot up full grown in our minds, leaving us quite ignorant of how and when and by what agency it was planted there and left to germinate. It seems highly probable that the prophet's message often takes such course with the remnant. If, for example, you are a writer or a speaker or a preacher, you put forth an idea which lodges in the Uberwustein of a casual member of the remnant and sticks fast there. For some time, it is inert. Then it begins to fret and fester, until presently it invades the man's conscious mind, and as one might say, corrupts it. Meanwhile, 
He has quite forgotten how he came by the idea in the first instance, and even perhaps thinks he has invented it. And in those circumstances, the most interesting thing of all is that you never know what the pressure of that idea will make him do. So there you are, my friends, the remnant. It's in God's hands. It's, it's seeds popping everywhere. And people don't even know how they come to these ideas. But it is, it is apart from the mass, the masses. It's, it's different. It's not a, a sheep following. You're thinking. It's, it's this rationality and free thought, which is why the independence is so essential. But God has a plan. Sometimes I wonder, well, what will happen if we don't have this church anymore? I don't have to be concerned. God's plan is unfolding. The remnant will continue, and we thank God for that. So we will go now and have a wonderful service. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. 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 Thank you.